As you're being seated, why don't you open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 37. Uh, Genesis chapter 37. We, we start a new section in the book of Genesis we, this week because uh, we're getting into the story of Jacob, one of the patriarchs of our faith. And it's kind of interesting. This is obviously, this is a big deal because Jacob, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph, um, he's roughly, roughly a quarter of the book of Genesis deals with the life of Joseph. So pretty interesting. So we're going to open up that account of Joseph today. Uh, Next week is this weird kind of interlude where it's not really as much about Joseph, at least for one chapter. By the way, next week, uh, parents of kids, those of y'all who are kind of on the edge of having kids in here or over in see kids, you might want to read ahead next week to make that decision before you come to church because it's more rated R material. There's been a lot of that kind of stuff in the book of Genesis. But just always, you know, keeping you all informed, let you know what's coming so you can make those kinds of decisions. Uh, But we're going to start out with Joseph this week, and we're going to relate even that chapter to the story of Joseph uh, as we go. Now today, it's going to be interesting for me because my eyes got opened this week in a way that was actually a little bit uncommon, okay? And what I mean by that is, here's what I do when I prepare to teach for you guys, okay? Uh, I do... my personal Bible study through that section of Scripture, okay, I do it for myself, then I go to do commentary work, okay, and then I might listen to a message or two, okay, and typically what will happen is if I, if I see some areas where there's disagreement, in other words, from the take that I have to the commentary, if things align, I usually feel pretty confident, but if I see disagreement, then I'll do more commentary work before I go listen to anything. And sometimes if everything lines up, then I'm pretty set and I'm like ready to go. Well, sometimes when things don't align, it, it, it says, hey, I need to look at this a little bit more closely, okay? So when I say I don't know how this is going to come out today, that's because when I originally did my personal Bible study, and read the commentary, I had one complete take. And by the time I finished listening and going back and rereading again, I had a completely different take. So when I say I don't know what's going to happen today, I don't know what's going to happen today, okay? I'm not as prepared as I normally am or as confident in knowing exactly what's going to come from me to you guys as I typically feel like I am. And just so you know, I'm, I'm okay with that um, because I'm a learner just like you guys are. Um, and, and some of what I say today, I, I won't preach it as being 100% definitive, but I'll give you some options. I'll give you some things to think about. And I think as a culture, we need to be provoked with the Word. And uh, I'm hoping that you might be provoked today. So let's pray together, and then we'll open up the Word, and we'll jump into this deal. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to serve your body through the teaching of your Word. And that's exactly what this is, a, a position of service And I pray that we would all have that same mind towards one another as you have towards us. Father, I confess before man and before you that your Holy Spirit is the author of your word. Your Holy Spirit is the chief communicator. Your Holy Spirit brings us understanding of your word. And so, Father, we just pray that you would be sovereign in this place over what is taught, over what we take away. If there is anything inappropriate, not of your heart, not according to your intent as the author, the singular author of all Scripture then cause it maybe just to be shut up inside of me, just shut me up, or just cause it just to be burned away as chaff blown away in the wind. But Father, whatever is of your spirit, is of your will, is according to your voice and your mind, then I pray that, well, we would engage with that, that it would take root in our hearts, that it would put down deep roots, and that it would produce biblical fruit in us for the rest of our lives. We thank you, Father, and we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, the title of the message this morning, again, covering Genesis chapter 37, is Perception Becomes Reality. You ever heard that phrase before? I think the phrase actually has biblical roots. Let me read you a verse. This is Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man thinks within himself, so he is. As a man thinks within himself, so he is. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I think that verse is actually taken a little bit out of context sometimes. But I think you can make an argument through that as well as other verses in Scripture that as a man thinks in his heart, that that kind of that perception becomes a reality oftentimes. Okay? Now, um, my goal today, the, the really the primary goal, I, I'll tell you guys, I'll, I'm going to do something real different for y'all right now. Why don't you just close your notebooks up and put your pens up today, all right? Y'all are like, what? I heard some of y'all gasp. What did he say to do? 
okay? He's lost his mind. Is, it, is, is that really Richie that's up there? Yes, okay. Put your notebooks up, okay? I don't have a bunch of points of application for you today. You're like, yeah, that's right, because you gave us three weeks worth last week, okay? I, that's true. I'm sorry. I, I probably did. Just put your notebooks up today. Uh, I want today to, to be an exhortation that we would take our biblical knowledge from a place of just knowledge to power, okay? And I want it to be an encouragement through the Word. It's just that simple. Maybe you hear things that you, you wish you could write down, and whatever the case may be, you can always go back and check that out again. But I just want today to be an exhortation to see knowledge go to power, okay? And I want it to be an encouragement to our faith. Now, before we jump into it, I also want to say this. Cleveland, Tennessee cracks me up. I'm a southern boy. You hear it in my voice. You know this, okay? But before, the, you know, before God ordained the planning of this church, I lived in Chattanooga. And even though this is considered a metro area, is Cleveland a little different from Chattanooga? Yeah, yeah a little bit. A little bit, okay? Cleveland, Tennessee is the most religious place I have ever seen in my life. I'm for real, like it blows my mind, okay? I mean, like you go to a movie, I'm sitting in a movie the other night and before the movie starts, the two guys behind me are talking about the church of God and the leadership structure and this, that, and the other. You're waiting in line to get a sandwich somewhere, it's hermeneutic this. You go somewhere else and you're doing this, it's epistemology that. You go somewhere over here and it's like you, you go to the bank to open up an account and the guy's like, oh, you're a pastor? I'm a pastor. You see that guy walking right there? He's a pastor. Sweet, that's, that's great. You go somewhere else and you hear people beside you and they're talking about spiritual gifts. You go somewhere else or talk about eschatology and it's like where am I like what in the world like this is the biggest Christian bubble I've ever seen in my life it's unbelievable there are some real benefits to that okay I don't want that to go past y'all because some of y'all see that on the outside and there's something in you that actually wants to push back against it I want you to know that some of that is good don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak y'all know what I'm saying there's some benefits to that there are some signs that the gospel has actually permeated and changed the culture in Cleveland Tennessee in some good ways so if you've got this feeling that all of that is bad I need you to push back against that a little bit I don't think that's actually true but with all the knowledge that we have in this town are we really living according to the power of God in our lives that's my question okay like is our town and is our area y'all know Chattanooga this entire metro area and when I named all those counties and everything this is all included and we're pretty diverse in here as far as where people are coming from y'all probably saw the research that over and over this has been the most biblically minded and the most church area in the United States of America so the question is is the knowledge translating into power in our lives, in our culture, in our communities, in our families. I'm hoping today will just be a little bit of an encouragement and a little bit of exhortation regarding that. Let's jump in to Genesis chapter 37. You're going to see a little flashback here, okay? You'll probably pick it up if you've been following along with us in the book of Genesis, but I'll point it out when you get there because it's not 100% chronological from where we've come from. Genesis 37, verse 1. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, how old? 17. Was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now, all those brothers that were out in the field, what do you know about them in terms of their ages if you come you know, from where we've come from so far? They were all older than him, right? Okay. Now, the youngest of all the brothers is Benjamin. He's even younger uh, than Joseph is. But at this point, Joseph is a youth. He's 17 years old. But the rest of those brothers who are in the field are all much older than he is. Okay. It's a long time before Rachel gave birth to Joseph. Well, he brings back a bad report about his parents, now, what, what, or about his brothers to his parents. Now, what do we call that with our kids? Tattletaling, all right? Are you supposed to tattletale? No. 
That is like blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is the unforgivable sin. It's tattletaling. I know y'all didn't know that. Write it down. Keep track of it. Don't quote me. Quote somebody else, okay? Now, that, no, it, it looks like a tattletale scenario. He goes out. He sees the oldest brothers. They're not doing their job. They're being lazy. They're dipping. You know, they're... they're, they're they're taking a nap, you know, when they're supposed to be chasing the sheep, you know, that the wolves are chasing away and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and he brings back a bad report to his parents. And this doesn't look good for any of the brothers to bring back that type of report about the other brothers, but especially the younger brother, okay? And you're going to learn more about him as you go. Verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons. Have we seen this before, y'all? Yeah, we actually saw this about Jacob and who, which was the wife that he loved the most. Y'all remember? It was Rachel, okay? We've actually saw this about Isaac regarding who? Remember Jacob and Esau? Did he have a preference between the two? Yeah, he, lo- he, he loved Jacob more than he did Esau. Has this ever turned out well when a parent showed blatant favoritism and more love for one than another or a husband? You know, <laughs> I say a husband. Did it ever turn out well when a husband loved one wife more than the other? <laughs> The answer is no in so many regards, okay? No, it just, it just, it's never a good thing. That type of favoritism and more love for one person in a family than another never turns out well. Verse 3, now look why he loved Joseph more than the others. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. Jacob was probably around 90, okay, when Joseph was born. And he made him a very colored tunic. Okay, now, do any of y'all have a note on the whole very colored tunic there, thing there? Maybe another translation in your Bibles? What does it say in some of your Bibles besides very colored? Technicolor? Yes, it calls it the Technicolor dream coat, yes. <laughs> My version says that too. Jeff, you obviously read from the message. It's an updated version, okay? All right. That wasn't a stone. That was just, I just thought that was funny when it came out. All right, so what, what does your version say besides the Technicolor dream coat? Yeah, full length, okay? If you do a little study on this, I'm not so sure that it was actually the coat of many colors, okay? And everything, my whole vacation Bible school worldview is shattered, okay? Um, I'm not quite sure that it was actually a coat of many colors, but it was like a long coat, okay? I'll put it like this. The guys who are working in the field and who were like chasing the wolves and bringing the sheep back and that kind of stuff, they wore like a vest kind of deal, you know, because you got to keep the arms free. You got to do some manual labor. And, and, and the, you know, down at the bottom, it probably came above the knee so they could run and move and have some flexibility and that kind of stuff. This type of deal, what it kind of looks like is this is like a full length, like selling watches on the street corner type of coat. Y'all know what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> That, that's, what I'm talking about. that's what you need to imagine. This thing probably went down to like the wrists, and it probably went down like close to the ankles, all right? And the deal was, the, the reason that's important to understand culturally is the person that wore that, they probably weren't doing the manual labor. But what were they probably doing? They were probably giving the orders. You know what I'm saying? It was almost a sign of authority. Now, again, in terms of the birth order, what is Joseph at this point as far as we know? He's probably the youngest, okay? And he's got the robe of authority on when he goes out to his brothers, and he's giving bad news about his brothers to his dad. Now, it's interesting to think about, why do you think he had the little robe of authority? Well, he was loved the most. That's what we know factually, okay? I don't know. We'll think about it. We might hit that a little bit more as we come back to it. Verse 4. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. And so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Couldn't have a discussion with him without it going south. If we talk, it's going to be an argument. It's going to be a fight, okay? This is kind of the attitude and the relationship between Joseph and his brothers. They hate him because their father shows him more love than they do to them. Verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to the dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. They hated him. They hated him more. Now they hate him even more. 
because of his position with his family, because of the position of authority that it looks like he's been given over them, and he's the youngest anyway. But it could also, that coat could also signal birthright, y'all, which is a big deal in this culture. And now they hate him even more because he's having a dream, which essentially to them is the younger brother pronouncing his ruling authority over his brothers. That's kind of the way they take it, and they hate him. Now, I think it's kind of interesting to think about this. There are differences of opinion as to what these dreams may represent in in kind of different ways. Now, obviously, a lot of you guys, because we're in Cleveland, Tennessee, and all of us have the Bible memorized from cover to cover, okay, um, most of us know where the story is going. So what does this dream of the sheaves probably represent? Well, the famine's coming, right? Okay. Most of us know the end of the story, and God's going to choose Joseph to provide for his family. And y'all know in the end, you know, they're actually going to bow down before him you know, through the way that God, God has sovereignly set this up. So this dream of the sheaves, it's, it's literally wheat. And in the future, that's literally going to be the salvation of his people. And the Israelites is through the sheaves of wheat. Verse 9. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. Now, what are you thinking right now? Just stop it. Just, just, just stop it, okay? Just close your mouth. Like, you don't have to tell anybody. If God wants to give you a dream, let him give you a dream. Just keep it on the DL. Don't tell your brothers again. They're going to hate you even worse. You've tried this before. You know it's not going to go well. So what does it seem like is happening? What does it feel like? Doesn't it feel like he's kind of rubbing their noses in it? You know what I'm saying? Hey, fellas, hey, boys, y'all go like this. Had me another dream. Uh huh. Let me tell you about it. Lo, I've had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow down or bow ourselves down before you to the ground? All right, now hold on for a second. There's the time stamp that I was talking about, okay? What did you notice in there that shows you this is a little flashback before last week? Who's still alive? Rachel, his mom. She died in childbirth with who? Benjamin, who is Joseph's younger little brother. So Benjamin hasn't been born yet. That's where we're at chronologically speaking if you're thinking about the time frame, okay? So at this point, Joseph is the youngest brother, And that kind of helps you put into some context the events that are happening right now. So his dad rebukes him, but then take note of verse 11. His brothers were jealous of him, naturally. I think it would be fair to say they hated him even more now, okay? But his father kept the saying in mind. Now, when you read the passage, what is the sense that you get about Joseph as a 17-year-old? What's the sense you get about him? Any thoughts? I get the sense about Joseph that he is a snot-nosed little brat. Is that what y'all get about him? Okay. All right. That's the sense that I got. That's what I got out of my Bible study. That's what I've been taught my entire life when I've heard this chapter taught. It has always been that Joseph is a snot-nosed, conceited brat, full of pride, can't wait to rule, let everybody know, tell them how it's going to be, that that's like his deal, that he's just all puffed up with pride. Now I'm going to tell you that I see it completely differently. I see it 100% differently, like 180 degrees than I saw it like two days ago, okay? And that's the part where it's like, I haven't figured all this out yet. So I'm standing before you right now telling you that I am still processing everything I'm going to share with you for the rest of today. Does that make sense? Still processing it. So I don't, I don't know how it's all going to come back out, okay? Now, here's the other thing I've heard about Joseph. I'm finding these now to be, you know, kind of almost contradictory ideas. I, I thought I knew two things about Joseph. The primary one was the first one referring to his character when he was a young man right here, is that he was a snot-nosed little brat. That's what I've been taught for all my life, and that's what I saw when I read the Scripture. Now, the second thing that I've heard, but I've never really heard anybody go into depth about it, okay, is that Joseph is a type or a picture of Jesus Christ. How many of y'all have heard that thought before? I'm just curious. Put your hands up if you've heard that thought. Okay. I'd say half-ish, okay, of you guys have heard that thought before. But I've heard the thought that Joseph is a type, a symbol, a picture 
a, pro- a prophecy even of the coming of Jesus Christ. I want you guys to know that's where I'm at today, much more so than I was even just a couple days ago. Okay, Now, uh, I want us to reimagine the story a little bit. Are, are y'all okay for a minute? If we just, I'm not talking about doing this dogmatically, as in, here, here's something y'all need to understand, okay? If anybody comes to you with the Word of God, which we have had for quite a while now, okay, and says, I have, for the first time, a very new teaching that no one has ever uncovered before in the history of the church. And it is the truth. What should you do? Very good, class. Very good, okay? What I'm about to share with you guys, again, I'm not going to teach dogmatically. It also is not the first place it came from. I got to this place after I did my personal Bible study, while I went and listened to some other people and saw what they had to say. And it just like, like it just, it just kind of clicked. And so what I'm going to teach you now is not a new teaching, okay? You just won't hear it the majority of the time, which you've heard about the character of Joseph as a teenager, and it just, it just seems to like, like make sense in my soul and in like my spiritual heart, okay? And that's what we're going to do. So let's imagine the story of Joseph as a shadow, okay, of the coming or a type of Christ figure, okay? Now, let's go back. Genesis 37, verse 1. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now, what if, okay, we're we're just speculating here, we're doing a hypothetical Okay, let let me read the next verse first. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. Okay, now what if, what if Joseph was given the, the, the coat of authority? What if he was given the place of authority? What if he was given the symbol of the birthright? What if he was giving the report of his brothers Because he was the brother that had the best character to be able to report and on the truth even when it was not popular. What if? What if? Did Jesus speak truth even when it was not popular among the leaders? Did he speak truth when he was going to be uh, persecuted for it? Absolutely. What if Joseph was a man of character even at a young age... So that he was given a place of authority and he had the trust of his father because you guys have already seen the trustworthiness of Reuben. Reuben is the firstborn and what did Reuben do? Slept with his father's concubine. You've seen the trustworthiness of Levi. You've seen the trustworthiness of Simeon. What did they do? Because of their their sister's rape, they take matters into their own hands and kill every man in a village where the one man committed sin against their their sister. I can't speak for every son, but we've discussed at length that this is a highly dysfunctional family with some major problems. So if there's a dude in the family that has real character and integrity, what's going to happen? He's going to stand out. And more than likely, when he stands out, what's going to also happen? He's going to be persecuted. And others aren't going to like necessarily what he has to say. Verse 4, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. And so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, please listen to this dream which I've had. Please listen to this dream which I had. Is there a chance that he's being sincere when he says please? What if he's trying to tell them a prophetic revelation that God is making that's going to save their family? What if, what if his motive is actually good and not evil? What if he's not holding his position of authority over them, but he's trying to lead them and maybe they won't listen? Is that possible? Is it possible? Does that sound like Jesus at all? It does to a degree. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? 
So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Did, did Jesus ever prophesy that he would have authority over the Jews? The Pharisees loved it when he told them that, didn't they? They loved it. You, what good thing can come out of Nazareth? The son of a carpenter out of Nazareth and you're going to rule over us? Come on. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I've had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Now, that last phrase really caught my attention. Okay? Jacob rebuked him for, for, you know, for revealing his dream to his family, to his mom and his dad and his brothers. Okay? But then it says, what did he do with it? He took an account of it. Okay? He made sure that he remembered it. All right? I've got a little girl who's eight years old. This is, this is where I'm kind of, you know, I didn't do this as an application, but I've got a little girl who's eight years old. Right now, she's very spiritually sensitive, okay? She, she's just very spiritually sensitive where she's at right now. Her heart is very open to whatever, the, you know, to, to the Lord. Um, she told her mom, you know, just recently, she's, she's like, Mom, I know this sounds crazy, but I really think that God is telling me that I'm supposed to be a nurse. Now, what do you think we did with that as an eight-year-old girl? What do you think we did with that? Do we say, oh, baby, you don't have to worry about that. Stop thinking that way. You're eight years old. Just be a little girl. and just Man, just don't even worry about that. Come on, just forget. Let's go watch some cartoons. Come on. I think, I think uh, Shopkins is on you know, YouTube. Let's go watch Shopkins for a little while and you know, numb our minds and kill our brain cells. <laughs> Y'all think that's what we did? No. Okay. You know, that it was more of a conversation of, you know, hey, maybe that is God. And maybe you need to listen to that voice and let's remember that. But I can promise you mom and dad took note of what she thinks now, even as an eight-year-old, that the Lord may be saying to her. We took note of it. Now, that phrase reminded me greatly of Luke chapter 2 and verse 51. Okay? Jesus is a youth. He's around, I want to say he's 12 years old or something of that nature in Luke chapter 2. The caravan has pulled away from town. Everybody else are going on to the next place. They're going back home. And all of a sudden, Joseph and Mary realize that little Jesus boy isn't playing back with all the kids in the caravan. All right, right? So they go back looking for him. And where was he? He was in the temple. And he was listening to the teachers. And he was interacting with them. And he was asking questions. And they were marveling at his understanding and the questions that he was asking. And it sounds like there's kind of a rebuke from Mary. Like, I mean, what would you do if your 12-year-old had been gone for a full day and you didn't know where they were, okay? What would you do as a parent? You'd probably be actually angry, mostly because you were fearful of what was going to happen to them and their safety. So it sounds like a rebuke from Mary, like, what in the world are you doing? You're supposed to be with us. Why are you over here? And, and it sounds like Jesus, it almost, if you read it in one way, it almost sounds like smart alecky. But then you remember, oh, this is Jesus speaking, okay? And so you, have, you, you remember to put it in context of the life of Jesus. And he's just very matter of fact. And he's like, Mom, don't you know i got to be about my father's business? Like, i got to be in my father's house, okay? And she took note of it, okay, in a very, very similar way. She, she treasured that. She, she took that memory into mind. It sounds like very much like this. You know, this second dream, the sun and the moon and the stars, you know what it sounds like to me from a symbolism standpoint? It sounds like the promise given to Abraham. Remember, he was to have children and descendants as the sand on the seashore and what? The stars in the sky. It sounds very much to me like God telling Joseph and even to the family that, hey, this is how the covenant is going to pass. Okay, And it did. Verse 12, then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Okay, not going to draw a lot of conclusions, but would you think they'd want to go back anywhere near Shechem at any point in time for any reason? Man, I wouldn't think so. I'd want to stay a long ways away from that place. Verse 13, Israel, or Jacob, remember his name has been changed, and the scripture uses both names for him at this point. Israel said to Joseph, 
Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to them, or said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring back word to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering the field. And the man asked him, What are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They've moved from here. For I heard them say, let's go to Dothan, which just makes me laugh because I can only think of Alabama. So Joseph went to his brothers and found them at Dothan. When they saw him from a distance and before he came close to him, they, them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits and we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. All right, now, stop for a second. Are y'all thinking about this as being a type of the story of Christ? If you do, you're going to make some interesting connections in here. And when I give them to you, you're going to kick yourself because you didn't think about them first. Okay? So I need you to be thinking, like, who are these characters? What's the scene? What, how does this compare to, you know, the coming of Christ and his crucifixion? And I want you to be thinking about that a little bit as we're going. Don't lose sight of that while we're reading through the account of what happens to Joseph. Verse 21. But Reuben, what, by the way, what's the birth order here? Who's Reuben? He's the oldest. He's the firstborn. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to their father. So Jacob's trying to trick the, or Reuben's trying to trick the rest of his brothers into sparing his life so that he can deliver him back to their dad. Now, I need you to keep in mind, at this point in time, you've got the 11 brothers counting Joseph. How many of the brothers are apparently going along with the plan to kill Joseph? you got nine going along with the plan wanting to kill him. You've got one trying to rescue him. Now, do you all think Reuben is a hero? Watch his motive. Watch his motive for trying to rescue Joseph. Verse 23. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. So they take their youngest brother, they strip the cloak off of him, okay, the tunic, they throw him in the bottom of the pit, and then they go a few yards away, and what do they do? Sit down and eat a meal. What does that tell you about their character? What do you think Joseph is doing right now? He's pleading for help. He's screaming, get me out of the pit. You know, let, please rescue me. Don't do this to me. And they're sitting down to eat a meal. It's almost like they're cherishing this power that they're exerting over him between these nine or ten brothers that are showing him who's the boss. Okay? It's just nasty. It's perverse. I mean, they're, they're enjoying his suffering and his pain while he's in the pit. Carl Barnhouse says this, It took 25 years for the cries of Joseph to go from their ears to their hearts. 25 years before they stand in front of him, and they, they, are, they are just, I mean, just struck down to the core of how they have sinned when he is revealed to them as being alive. 25 years. Y'all know that's part of the purpose of doing this today, okay? Is we have a lot of knowledge. We don't have nearly as much power. Are we walking according to what we know? Just according to what we know. That's a heavy burden for all of us, myself included. Are we walking? Let's walk in more of what we know. That it doesn't take 25 years for the knowledge of this to go from here to here. Just about 12 inches. Okay. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. I hear the mercy there. Just mercy, just dripping with mercy. And his brothers listened to him. 
Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Y'all see any connection there with the story of Jesus? It's right there. It's right there in front of you. By the way, little note from where we've come from. Do y'all remember what the translation, if you look up the word Egypt, what it means? Do y'all remember? It's a little Bible trivia for some of you guys that have been with us all the way since the beginning of in the beginning. Okay? Egypt, translated Mizraim. Okay? Genesis 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 6, Mizraim was the grandson of Noah. Okay? When we traced back the biblical genealogy spreading out to the entire world, the grandson of Noah, basically his descendants, they were the ones who went further south and settled into Egypt. Verse 29. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. Now tearing the garments was a sign of mourning. It was a sign of repentance. Okay, It was a sign of great distress. Verse 30, he returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? Reuben is a hero, isn't he? Just through and through. No. What's Reuben concerned about, y'all? He's concerned about himself. He's not worried about Joseph. He is the oldest. He has some sort of responsibility to be, you know, kind of oversee what's going on out there. He's just trying to save Joseph to save his own skin because he's afraid it's going to come down on him. Okay, This is the heart of man. you got ten brothers out desiring to kill one of their other brothers. And then they say, hey, that's not a good plan because why do we profit off of it? Let's at least sell him and make the money like we would sell him a slave. And then you got the one guy not really trying to do what's right, basically trying to save his own skin in the eyes of his family. That's it. No concern other than self. And this is their brother. So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Now, you guys have insight that Jacob did not have right now. Is his son dead? No. But what is his perception? His perception is that Joseph is dead and he will never see him again. So what becomes his reality? Mourning. It's not even based on truth. I need y'all to hold on to that thought. His perception is not even based on truth, yet it powerfully, powerfully affects how he thinks and how he lives, how he governs his life. I need y'all to think about how true that is for us. It is not a law that perception always governs our reality, but it is a powerful, powerful truth that we need to be very highly aware of. Verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer and captain of the bodyguard. All right, now let's take this out for a second. Let's play a little game. You want to play a little game? Okay. It's a matching game. Okay. I should have done a slide for this, you know, and I didn't, so... I'm going to give you some names, okay? Well, let's see. Y'all might already have this figured out, okay? Um, I'm going to give you some characters in the story of the crucifixion of Christ, okay? And you're going to tell me which character they would be in Genesis chapter 37, okay? Y'all ready? Like, yes, let's play a game, okay? All right, so here we go. In uh, Genesis 37, who represents God the Father? Come on, don't be shy. Israel. Yeah, that, that's Jacob. He is the father of Joseph. He's the one that sends him to do his work as God sent the son to do his work here on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? Um, who is Jesus in this portrayal? That's Joseph. Okay, those are the easy ones. All right? Uh, here's another one. Who's Mary? Yeah, that's Rachel. Okay? The mother of Jesus, obviously. But what do you know about Rachel's life that kind of compares her to Mary? 
She was barren for years, okay? Years and years and years and years. She was barren for the longest time. And God opened her womb, and he gave her a son, and this was Joseph, okay? Now, remember, we've talked about this a lot. I fully believe, I believe very strongly that the reason you see God opened the womb so much in the book of Genesis and the Old Testament, and you have this thought and this doctrine that it is God who opens and closes the womb, is because God needed to prepare us to have faith that there could be such a thing as a virgin birth. Okay, I believe strongly that's why he talks about this theme so much in Scripture, is we have to understand that God is the one who opens and closes the womb, period. And if he wants to do that, you know, in Mary without having a guy who contributes, so be it. Because you know who opens and closes the womb? God. Not a man and a woman. All right? So we know who God is in the story. We know who Jesus is. We know who Mary is. Um, Who is Pontius Pilate? That's a harder one. Reuben. Very good. Okay? I heard that right off the bat from some of you guys. All right? Reuben is Pontius Pilate. You might have to think about that a little bit. Okay? Um, Who's Judas? That's Judah. Judah is the one who came up with the plan to sell him for the 20 pieces of silver. Okay? You need to adjust for inflation. Okay? Remember? Okay? You got to adjust for inflation. Okay? Um, This is essentially the price of a slave, which essentially is what Jesus got sold for um, by Judas. By the way, look up the word Judas, uh, the Greek, in the New Testament. Do you know what an alternative translation of Judas is? I, the answer is right in front of you. What is it? It's Judah, okay? Judah Judas is essentially the same name uh, in Greek, which is kind of interesting. All right, now, I'm just going to run through this. You do not have to write this down. As a matter of fact, you can Google the similarities in the story of Joseph to the account of Jesus just as quickly as I can, and you will see an endless number of resources that have been compiled where you can read through everything that I'm going to share with you plus ten times more. Okay, right right there, just like that. No time at all. And you can go back and look at this anytime you want to. But I just want to do this to provoke you to think about this. Okay, similarities between the story of Joseph and Christ. You've got a miraculous birth in the barren mother Rachel and Mary was a virgin. You've got Joseph in Genesis 37 too, as well as Jesus and Matthew, Luke, and, and, and Mark speaking truth and exposing sinful behavior of others, knowing he would be hated and ostracized. Genesis 37 too, Joseph is a shepherd. In John 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. They were beloved sons of their fathers. Jacob loved him more than any of his other sons. In Matthew 3, Jesus is baptized. He comes up out of the water and the father says, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. He was hated by his brothers without cause. If you notice, there are a couple of biblical characters besides Jesus that have major portions of Scripture devoted to them who you will never see... I'm not saying they never committed sin because we know there's only one human being in all of human history is not sin. That is Jesus Christ. But you will find two huge biblical characters that you will not find without interpreting that they committed sin. Do you know who those two are? Daniel and Joseph. Okay? You'll see it. There's a, you can't find, you might can interpret that he sinned. Maybe he actually was a brat. Maybe he really was, and he still was a Christ-like figure, okay? That could, that could very well be true. I need you all to understand that. But you won't find anywhere overtly that Joseph actually sinned. He was hated by his brothers without cause. Jesus was, he came to save his own, and he was rejected by them, and they hated him. His brothers hated him. He was hating for, hated for telling truth and prophesying in Genesis 37, 5, as was Jesus in John 8, 40. He foretold his future position, exalted position as king or ruler. In Genesis 37, 5 through 8, in Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said, You will see me coming on the clouds and sitting at the right hand hand of the heavenly father and the Pharisees hated him for talking about that position of authority that he would have. Jacob, or sorry, Joseph was persecuted out of the jealousy of his brothers in Genesis 37, 11. We see in Matthew 27, 18 that Jesus was handed over to be, to be crucified because of envy. That specific emotion, it was envy that caused the Jewish leaders to hand him over. 
Joseph willingly went out to do the work of his father at his father's request. John 8, 42, Jesus said, I don't go out on my own initiative, but he, the father, sends me to do his work. He was plotted against. Joseph was by his own brother in Genesis 37, 20 as they plotted to kill him. In Matthew 26 and John 11 and all the Gospels, you see the plot of the high council. You see the plot of the Jewish leaders, the brothers of Jesus, plotting to kill him. Joseph suffered bitterly at the hands of his brethren in the bottom of that pit as Jesus suffered on the cross. Joseph was stripped of his robe as he was sent to the cross. In John 19, Jesus is is stripped of his robe. In Psalm 22, it was prophesied that they would actually cast lots for his clothing and everything that came along with him. In, In Genesis 37, with Joseph, Judah offered to sell Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. In Matthew chapter 1, you know, Judah says, hey, what's the price? What are you going to give me to sell you Jesus? They said 30 pieces or shekels of silver. The leaders attempted to rescue him from the hands of the brethren. You know, Reuben, we, we compared him to, to Pontius Pilate. What was Pilate's attitude when it came to Jesus? Dude, I, I, it, he was playing politics, y'all. Okay, He didn't really want to kill Jesus, if, if you really read what was going on there. Okay. He kind of got manipulated by the system and by the politicians. He wanted to wipe his hands of the whole kind of thing, but it was to save himself. Reuben played that same part. Hey, let's, let's don't kill him. Let's throw him in a pit. Pontius Pilate said, let's don't kill him. Let's scourge him, okay? Let's just hurt him real bad, and maybe we can satisfy everybody. But it was done for the wrong motives. In Genesis 37, 28, Joseph was taken to Egypt as a youth. After he escaped the pit. In Matthew 2.14 we learn that Jesus was taken to Egypt. Because Herod the Great was killing all the children in Jerusalem. Trying to keep the prophesied Messiah from coming. They both went to and came out of Egypt. Besides that I already mentioned to you guys. If you look you want to look carefully. Again you can interpret. But you won't find any specific sin in Joseph. Do you find any sin in Jesus? No. None at all. You could say that Joseph was wounded by the transgressions of his brothers. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. What was the reason Joseph was wounded? It's so that he could actually deliver his own brothers that wounded him. Why was Jesus wounded for our transgressions? So that he could deliver us. Okay, Y'all, that, that's just like scratching the surface. That, that's just the very tip of the iceberg. Okay? Now, here's why I want you guys to to understand that and to know that. And the more we study the book of Genesis, you see, we did something very similar to this when we were in Genesis 22 with Abraham and Isaac on the mountain. Okay, y'all remember? Okay. Now, these are historically accurate events. They really happened. Joseph really happened. Abraham and Isaac really happened. Okay. These things really happened. And yet... God, uh, uh, you know, he he leaves this account for us. He preserves it so that we can see the the actual accounts and learn from those. They were written for our instruction, but also so that we can see that prophecy. And we can see the symbolism. We can see him pointing to Jesus. And we can take this entire thing, the entire counsel of the word of God, and we can have confidence in it. I need you to understand And I want you to allow others to understand that just because we call ourselves Christians and we believe in supernatural things, it does not mean that we have a blind faith. This is not a blind faith. It is not all revealed. We don't know all the pieces. We don't know how it all works. We certainly don't live it to perfection. But we certainly have some real, true, solid evidence to base the things that we believe on. Amen? It's right here, and it's over and over again, okay? Now, here's here's what I want you guys to understand, okay? Here's where I want this to be an encouragement to your faith and hopefully to help us translate knowledge into power. This idea that perception becomes reality. Well, you know, my favorite basketball player when I was growing up, um, his name was Dominique Wilkins, okay? How many of y'all know Dominique Wilkins? This is going to, okay, all right. For some of y'all folks that don't, I'm sorry. You know, look up the videos. Um, 
The shorts were short, but he, but he, man, he could jump. Oh, he could jump. Man, he could jump. Dude would hit his head on the rim sometimes. He could jump. Okay. Now, just because I perceive that I'm Dominique Wilkins doesn't mean I'm about to walk across the hall over to that gym and take a ball and jump and in the air bring it down, you know, below my waist and turning in the air and bring it back over my head and just rip it. Just because I believe that, it doesn't mean that that's going to happen, okay? But what do you mean by perception becomes reality? Well, see, perception, okay, what I'm talking about, the type of perception that we need, we need our perception to be based on the truth and not to be based on things that are in error, all right? So this doesn't work 100% of the time. But here's what I need you guys to understand. This idea, I think, comes from biblical roots. My favorite story that, that uses this idea, okay, that, that your belief becomes your perception, is more stated as this, as you believe, so you are, or as you believe, it will be done to you. And my favorite one's in Matthew 8, okay? I love this parable. The centurion is speaking to Jesus, all right? And, and the centurion comes up to Jesus just kind of seemingly off the street. It's not like he looks like he's been following him around, listening to his teachings or whatever the case may be. But obviously the guy has faith. Centurion comes up to Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus, um, I too am a man under authority. I know how authority works. When I tell a soldier to run over there, he runs over there. When I tell a soldier to jump, he says, How high? When I tell a soldier to go do something, he goes and does it. I know what kind of authority you've got. I've got a servant back at the house. Okay, I think he's about to die. Would you heal him? And Jesus marveled at his faith. He says, man, I, I have never seen faith like this around here. As you believe, so it will be done. It was his faith. It was his belief. It's an incredible story of faith. Now, I need you to think about something. I want you guys to know that you can have a certain hope, a certain expectation, a certain faith that the things you claim to believe in really did happen, and they really are true in a culture that fights and pushes against that all the time, calls you names, persecutes, everything else, okay? So that, why do you need to have that faith? So that we transition our knowledge into power with all the promises that are made to us in this book that we already have so much knowledge of. What, what are you talking about, okay? I'm talking about this. Can you be free from that besetting sin? Yes or no? Yes, because according to Romans 6, 18, you are truly free from sin. It is not master over you. Let your perception become your reality. Let your faith, your belief be translated into power that you do have freedom. You don't have to look for it. You don't have to do something else. You have freedom over besetting sin in this room right now. Let that perception become your reality. In Jeremiah 31, you are loved with an everlasting love. I guarantee you there are some folks in here right now that tend to believe and meditate on the thought that they are not truly loved or accepted by anyone. You are loved on the authority of Scripture in everlasting love by an everlasting Heavenly Father who loves you perfectly, much more so than anyone else ever could or ever will. He will not fail you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5, no matter what your circumstances tell you. He suffers with you, no matter how badly you're suffering. He is there with you. You are not alone on the authority of Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. In your marriages that are struggling, you men, you husbands, you do have the capacity to love your wives and to love them sacrificially as Christ loved the church and even to lead your households in the authority of Ephesians 5.25. You wives who have husbands that do not always re deserve respect do have the capacity to respect your husbands on the authority of Ephesians 5.22. Your provision has already be ta been taken care of. You're asked not to worry about tomorrow or what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll wear. God has already provided these things, but instead, focus on, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. You need to understand that your prayers actually are not bouncing off the ceiling, 
Someone is listening to them. And the prayers of a righteous man, a redeemed man, not a perfect man, just a redeemed man, someone who has a relationship with the Savior, can accomplish much. James 5.16. You need to understand that though you may feel like you don't make a difference and never will have a chance to make a difference, that you have a ministry, not in the future, not if you go into vocational ministry, but you have a ministry intended for you as an individual right now on on the authority of 1 Peter 2.5. You are a priest and a minister to God, no matter what your vocation is. Or direction is. You need to understand, you are not in a dead-end job. You may not enjoy it a lot. You may have something else in mind right now. But I need you to understand, on the authority of 1 Corinthians 10.31, we are to do all things as unto the Lord. So what does that mean? It means your work matters to God, no matter what it is that you are doing. So do it in that sense. Let your perception become your reality. You need to understand that despite all your fear and despite all of your anxiety, despite everything thing that kind of besets you in your mind and that you tend to focus on so much of the time that you can have peace even in the midst of anxiety according to Philippians 4, 6 through 7 and ultimately above all things. You need to understand on the authority of the word of God in Romans 10, 9 through 10 that if you believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, that you are or that if he brings you to that point that you will be saved. And you will spend eternity with your heavenly Father. Eternity. That's a long time, y'all. You will spend eternity with your heavenly Father in a perfect, perfect paradise. Where there will be no more mourning, no more pain, no more crying, no more shame, no more suffering, no more anxiety, no more fear, no more worry about provision, no more any of those things. You can have faith in those things. That's what I'm talking about. There's so much evidence to put your faith in that all of these things are true and right and honest and noble and excellent and worthy of praise. So let that thought be an encouragement to your souls so that you will transfer all of that knowledge up in these melons we got. Okay, Man, it's just so much and I hear so much of it right now. Let's let it be translated into power. Power. Our lives characterized by power. Mine's not always either. Okay, it's something to shoot for. But I want to encourage you guys in that. Let me pray for us this morning. Father God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in here that you would, through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that you would take their knowledge and that you would change it into power in their lives. Power over sin. Power to love their families power to walk in the ministry that you've called them to, power to whatever that you want to equip them and and accomplish in them, Father. But I pray that that power will be something that would be characteristic in our lives as individuals and then also as a a church, like a, a capital C church, the universal body of Christ. And Father, I know that while we have a lot of benefit of what you've done in our, in our area, Father. I also know there's a bunch of folks who are out there hurting and in the midst of a place where you've made such a difference, they almost feel like they're even further removed from it. And they wonder, well, if it was real, why doesn't this happen? And if it was real, why don't these people do this? And if it was, Father, would you, would you meet those folks? And would you even help us to make a greater impact in all of our spheres of influence, whether it be in church, whether it be at work, whether it be in our families or in our social events, whatever the case may be, to help us not compartmentalize and say, hey, this is my secular life and that's my spiritual life. But that we would be constantly aware and looking for opportunity, constantly open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, constantly open to you showing us, teaching us, sanctifying us, open to opportunity to minister to others. And Father, again, through so much stuff we talked about this morning, I just pray that you would exhort and that you would call out people today in a healthy way and that you would encourage their souls. Father, I thank you and pray these things in the name of Christ.